This episode of the Blackstick Global Podcast is sponsored by Blackstick Global Passport. Join aspiring Black expats, expats, and repats, where you can build community, get resources, and gain support along your journey abroad. You're invited to join Blackstick Global Passport. Inside Passport, you'll find exclusive workshops on everything from expat taxes, financial planning, insurance, job boards, accountability check-ins, and more. More. You can even take Passport on the go with our app available for iOS and Android devices. Just click the link in the episode you're listening to or visit blacksitglobal.com and click on Passport. See you inside. People here try to help me in English in a way that people in America generally are not trying to help people in any other language. Close your eyes and imagine living a life you love unapologetic and unbothered, free from daily microaggressions from Karens and Kens, free from the fear of police brutality and systemic racism. Wouldn't that feel amazing? Now open your eyes. What if I told you that it's possible? Hear inspiring stories and get the actual blueprints from brothers and sisters of the diaspora who are living out their wildest dreams abroad. You've heard the term, now be inspired by the movement. I'm Krishan Wright, and this is Blacksit Global. I am so excited to talk to my next guest. This is someone I admired from afar on the socials and attended her phenomenal summit last year. I am delighted to have her on the show to talk about career breaks taking a sabbatical, and moving on from burnout to bliss. Welcome to the Blacksit Global Podcast, Rashida Dow. Hey, 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 hey. Okay, so for real, I need you to do my introductions whenever I walk in a room. Like not just <laughs> on a show, not just on a podcast, but like I walk in a, I want you to be there when I enter any, even, even like the bathroom, like I'm in a restaurant, I walk in the bathroom. I want you to be there giving the introduction you just gave, because that is the best one I've heard so far. And that makes me super, super happy to be here. We're starting off good. Yes. I love it. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Well, you know, I could be a hype girl. So yes, I see, I see you are good at that. Awesome. Well, you have a phenomenal background in addition to being the biggest champion of Black women taking a break, and we'll get into that in this episode. You're also an attorney, and I want to talk about so many things, um, but I want to start with the beginning, like your story. You're joining me now from Mexico City, but there's definitely a leap <laughs> that occurred. So give our listeners a little bit of background. Okay. Uh, my story is one of those long twisty stories that sometimes I forget things about, but I'll try to keep it as short as possible for those listening today who don't already know me. If you're unfamiliar, I was an attorney working in the Bay Area in California. I loved the work I did. I did not love the people I did it with, which made working tremendously difficult. Um, lots of tech bros, lots of people who think they know everything when they don't. As a Black woman in the workplace, especially a Black woman who with a uh, specialized skill, I often went through experiences where people not really discredited my knowledge, but kind of didn't give it the deference that it deserved, right? Like, I don't need you to treat me like a queen. But if I'm the only lawyer in the room, let's not discuss legal stuff and act like I'm not here. Cause like, I am truly the only one who knows what's like, who knows the answer to that question. And the three of you guys are sitting here talking. You're like, I'm not here. Like what, what's happening. So there was a lot of moments like that, which made me realize that that job was not for me. Um, and so I didn't shed too many tears when the company went out of business. And when the company went out of business, I didn't know what I wanted to do next with my life. Um, they were being purchased by someone, like the assets of the company were being purchased by someone. And that company was looking for people, but I knew better. It was too much of the same thing. And I was like, I can't, I can't go down that route. And I was interviewing for jobs, but it was really like jobs I didn't want it. Like I was interviewing for a job 
to have a job, not because these were jobs I wanted, but because it was like, I'm a black woman. I live in the Bay Area, which is expensive as heck. And I was like, how do I pay to live here without a job? And then it dawned on me that I didn't have to live here. Like living, I went to college in the Bay Area. So moving back to the Bay Area had been a dream of mine for a while because I was in the Midwest and I didn't want to be in the Midwest anymore. I wanted to be back in the Bay Area. Um, But after a few years, I realized that my lifestyle in the Bay Area was full of highs and lows. Like I was doing the things I wanted to do on the weekends, in the evenings with my friends. I was having a good time. I had a good life. And then I went to work, right? And I was like, this is this ain't exactly what I signed up for, right? Like I was working extremely hard in a job that did not deserve me or my talents with people who did not deserve me or my talents and did not appreciate me and my talents. And I was doing that just to afford to live in the Bay Area. And I think a lot of people experience that, whatever city you're in, the level of work you do often aligns with what it costs to live there. Like you are working in this job that you don't love because how else are you going to pay your mortgage or your rent or whatever, right? Like, And so I thought I'd see people take breaks before. I am my, the second side thing I do is I'm a yoga teacher. And so in the yoga world, I would see people who like were baristas in coffee shops for six months and then went to Bali for another six months just to not to work, but just like do yoga. And I was always like, girl, how, how, how do you like, I am a full time lawyer. I can't take, how do you do that? And then there's another part of me, which was, I think, is ingrained in a lot of us. I'm an immigrant. I'm a child of immigrants. There's a lot of like, you, you're you expected to be responsible. You're expected to get like the best job you can get. You're expected to like work your butt off forever. My mom's Jamaican and had like, she had the typical seven jobs, right? When I was growing up. And so just the idea of taking a break and not working seemed impossible. It seemed irresponsible. It seemed like something that had worked, that someone who'd worked so hard to get where they got, I worked really, really hard, went to a lot of school, put up with a lot of bullshit from coworkers to get to where I was. You don't just give that up. But at the same time, I wasn't happy. And it was like, what do I do to make myself happy? And The idea that a lot of us, a lot of society is kind of wedded to is that we have to be productive. We have to be productive members of society, right? And you are what you produce. Your value as a human is what you create. It's what you produce. It's who you are. Like those are the things that seem to matter in American society, I wondered what life would be like if I didn't work, right? Like I wasn't thinking deeply about like, oh, my place in society. I was like, I'm tired of showing up every day and talking to these men. Tired. I am tired. I decided to take a break. I did the math, which is one thing I'll tell everyone. People who think they cannot take a break, do the math. Figure out how much it would cost. It frequently costs less than you think. And you frequently might have some more money than you think too. And so sitting down and doing the math and seeing how you can fund a break was something I didn't, I did it in one night. Like, and that one night changed my life. I looked at my accounts and I was like, I could travel for a year. I could do that for a year. Um, And then I did, I put all my stuff in storage, which was not the best idea ever because three years later, my stuff is still in storage and I have not been back to the Bay area. Girl, I made mistakes. Um, But I learned from my mistakes. (laughs) So I left the Bay Area in uh, the beginning of May, 2000, or middle of May, 2018. I went traveling around the world. And then May, 2019, I moved to Mexico City because it's my favorite city in the world. And then since then, I was stuck in the US for a year, COVID related, injury related. And then I'm back in Mexico now. But yeah, my journey 
wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for a whole bunch of coincidences lining up. And since then, I've been helping other women not wait for the coincidences, not wait for the right moment, but I've been helping them create the right moments. I create the situation where you can take a break, where you can step back and realize that you were not born to be a tool of capitalism. Like I used to say back in the day, like my job is making rich people richer. Like that is truly what I, I make rich people richer. But for how many of us, if you look at what you do at the core of it, that's what you do. You make rich people richer, right? For not and someone I know is saying, I don't do that. And that's fine. Like not everyone, right? We, some people have a special mission and it will never be involved in capitalism. And I get that. But for a good percentage of us, our job is to make rich people richer. And it is what it is. I decided about six months into my break that I could no longer go step back into a work environment like I was in before. And I do not believe that any work environment that involves me clocking in anywhere at any time will be different. And so I've started to do some work for myself. I've started some ventures to help other Black women free themselves from the remnants of slavery, if we're being perfectly honest. Like the idea that production is what you're here for, we're not, we're not here. Like I am put on this planet to truly enjoy myself. That is my main goal every day is to live a life where I feel fulfilled. I feel happy. I feel present. I feel joy. Joy is my number one priority. And I want, listen, going back to being a lawyer, there's no joy in that for me. There just isn't. And so I'm not interested in it. I don't have to work in the way that America tells me I have to work. I don't have to produce in the way that America thinks my value is is reflective of what I produce. God did not make me to be a workhorse. Like that's just not, mm -mm, nope. And a lot of our ideals come from that space that like work is the number one. When we talk about when self-care is talked about in articles and in news, even that is often shaped in a way to make you a better employee, like beating burnout so you can come back to work stronger and happier. Why do I need to learn how to deal with like the Sunday night sads instead of expecting corporations to give us, to give us better work environments. So we're not sad on Sunday nights. Why is that pressure on me? Why can't these companies ever do anything to make the working environment better? And giving me, you know, Juneteenth off, but taking away another holiday does not make the working day better. It doesn't, right? But I've clocked out of the idea that working for anyone else is going to get me where I want to go because where I want to go is joy. Where I want to go is peace. Where I want to go is happiness. And I've been working for a long time. I've been working since I was 12. And none of those jobs have ever brought me joy, happiness, or peace on a scale that has been impactful in my life. That is so powerful because you dropped so many gems and nuggets there. I was just like, yes, because you're right. It's all the culture here is all about production, all about increasing output. But meanwhile, you're functioning at a diminishing capacity. And that is not a sustainable thing. And whether or not people, and oftentimes I will say, including myself, we're not always as cognizant and as dialed in as we should be to what's going on, whether it's a toxic workplace environment or it's showing up with not being able to sleep, not being able to pay attention, being irritable around the people that you love, becoming distant and saying, hey, I don't want to hang out because you're exhausted or you ha- you're you uh, overwhelmed with feelings of shame because you think you should be at it, you know, um, performing at a certain level, which you might be at work, but inside you're falling apart. And so that I think is the gift. And it's interesting because when I encountered you, it was first, I think, around the career break 
and I was going through that time frame myself, those issues. And it's interesting for some people, whether they language it as a gap year, a career break, a sabbatical, it isn't as foreign as a concept as we think. I think the the closest is a woman that goes out on maternity leave or if someone gets surgery and they go on disability. But those things are time bound and it's usually requires you to convalesce. And so you're not out, you know, living your best life, right? In most cases, Mm -hmm. but the concept is kind of similar. It's like putting a pause, stopping work, but being able to then pay attention to you and your needs. So for you, you talked a lot about joy and joy is really what drives you. So when you made that decision to take a career break, which ultimately was a retirement from (laughs) being an attorney, how did you land on this mission to encourage other women to experience that same level of freedom that same level of joy? Okay, that's actually a great question. And I'm going to tell you what I tell other people who are in my place. So I coach women who are going through this, as you mentioned. And one of the things that comes up is when we talk about uh, what the future holds for them, sometimes there's anxiety about what to do after their break. And what I tell them is it'll come to you. When you give yourself space to not be a stressed out, burned out employee, the answers will come to you. When you give yourself space to breathe and to relax, it comes to you. What came to me was women contacted me and said, I see what you're doing. Can you help me do it too? And enough people came to me that I was like, wait, there's a need here. There's a need and I can help them. And so it wasn't a grand plan when I left. It wasn't like, I am going to leave and I'm going to do this coaching and I'm going to help women. People who were burned out and stressed out Black women in that situation would get sent my information by someone else who heard. So it was just like this network of people who like sent my info on to other people. And then these strangers on the internet would contact me and say, hey, can you talk to me about X? I want to do this too. How do I do Y? And eventually it turned into a whole coaching program. It turned into a summit. It turned into another big event this year. And including all of our summit attendees, thousands, thousands of Black women I've talked to, thousands. And it's insane because when I was planning my break, I felt alone. I felt like there was no one out there who had done that. And I recognize that it's not because there were, I'm not a trailblazer. Like I'm not the first person to do this, but the stories are, weren't being told a lot. And so because the stories weren't being told a lot, I didn't know who to contact. My friends didn't know who to put me in contact with. The people they put me in contact with, now that, now that I think about it, were men. There were some black men who had done something like this. And so a couple of, yes, I was introduced to a couple of black men like this, but there were no, no one said, Hey, I know a sister who's doing X, Y, and Z, but the woman found me and they came to me. And now it's something I love, I love to do. I love to talk about the ways and the tools women can use to get free of a life that's holding them back. That's powerful. So with that, I think that's a nice segue into the Exodus Summit that you did with your business partner, Stephanie Perry, who we've had on the Blacks of Global podcast last season. And the Exodus Summit was a phenomenally produced event. And there were thousands of women who were able to partake in the variety of sessions. And now, fast forward a year later, there's now a new version. So can you talk a little bit for those who are not familiar with the summit and really let's shed a little light on how this year is slightly different. Last year, we had women who lived around the globe, who had taken sabbaticals, who had become expats, who had gone on career breaks. We had them come and talk to our amazing audience of women about their experience, to give them information 
about how they did it. So we had no 50 something speakers over 40 something panels and talks in seven days. And I don't think I slept for the month before this event, but it was, um, you know, it was, I, I've never given birth, but it's like what I imagine giving birth is like, where it's terrible when you're doing it. And then when you're done, you're like, oh yes, it was all worth it. Look at this beautiful little baby. That's, that's how it felt like. But as we were going, we saw women taking action. We saw two distinct groups of women, women who heard the information and were like, boom, I'm done. We saw people quitting their job. It was a week summit. By like day two, uh, someone messaged me and said, I quit my job today. Okay. Uh, we had people who left on career breaks within a month of the summit and said, this is what inspired me to do it. Um, we have women who've moved abroad permanently, women who had never traveled alone abroad and who got inspiration from Exodus Summit and moved abroad and have been out of the country for like, I want to say like eight months now, like never gone abroad by themselves before and then moved abroad by themselves at least eight months now. But then we had another group of women and these are women who got inspired, took lots of notes, wanted to do lots of things, but didn't take action. And there are a number of reasons for not taking action. So this isn't at all a judgment. We have lifed over the past year, right? Like, whoa, things have been coming at us hot and heavy. So a lot of people's plans aren't going exactly the way they wanted them to go. But what we wanted to do this year was we wanted to have the women who took action last year come back and speak to our group this year. So the people who were at the summit last year as attendees, not as speakers, but as attendees, and have changed their life dramatically in the past 12 months. We're having them come back and speak to our this year's attendees about how they went from inspiration to action that was aligned with their life that got them to where they want to go. So we have people who are running, women who are running businesses overseas, Black women who are traveling with their children overseas, Black women who've moved overseas with their children, women who are working overseas, women who have, who are running business overseas. Like this, we want you to see yourself. That's, that's been really important for Stephanie and I. We want our attendees to be able to see themselves in the speakers. It is a summit for Black women attendees, and we have Black women speakers. It's very important to me that you can look at the person who's speaking and say, yes, this resonates with me. And when you have the, the similarity in race and gender, it just makes it a lot easier because I don't care what a man has to say about his experience abroad. Because in most countries, a man's experience abroad will be nothing like my experience abroad, right? Even if we have a similarity of both being Black, like there's something else going on here too. And that's something else like gender is something that is an influential aspect in our experience everywhere we are in the world. And so that's why it's a summit by Black women for Black women. I mean, I love it because you created the thing, whether it was Exodus Summit, Exodus Homecoming, the Burnout to Bliss platform, you created the thing that you wish was there when you first made your journey. And it's wonderful because it's attracted so many people. And I think one of the things that has helped so well is, you know, with the pandemic, it gave us all time to pause mm -hmm. and stop. We weren't running, running, running and doing things to distract ourselves from the things that were making us unhappy. And so being able to be still and then have a way to reframe what's around you, like, oh, gosh, this relationship or where I live or my job or all those things that may not feel like it's an alignment with what you know to be true in your gut, that small voice, that tiny mustard seed that's saying, hmm, something else is out there. I want to live my life on purpose. I just don't know how. And then here comes 
someone who is showing you the way, who is shining the light in the path forward. So I love, I love, I love it. And it reminds me, I need to get my ticket to Exodus homecoming. (laughs) You do, you do. Okay, so the event is September 24th through 26th. We have two levels of ticket. One is a weekend pass, which allows you to see all of the speakers this year. And during the weekend, watch the event, the um, speakers and the talks from last year. And then there's an accelerated class that comes with group coaching and a few other things, which you can find on exodushomecoming.com. It's a really great opportunity to lean into the thing you want, right? Like a lot of times we see programs. I, I'm online a lot. I see things and I'm like, yes, that looks nice, but, right? Like, but am I really going to do it? Or am I going to pay attention? Or am I going to, you know, ignore it? Or am I going to buy it and then never watch it? We don't want that for anyone. What, what's funny is like last year, we had, it was a full week event. It was Sunday night or maybe Sunday. I think it was sun, Sunday evening through like the next Sunday. It was, a, it was a very long time. I blocked out that part of the childbirth. But we had women who said their employers got absolutely no productivity out of them that week. A lot of people put in their headphones, had it on their phone at work or on, on one of the screens at work and was like, yes, mm-hmm, I'm working. Mm-hmm. Yes, girl, I'm working. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. While really just making plans to leave and that there's, there's no greater compliment, right? Like I, this is what I want from you. I want you to not come to a summit that you're like, eh, it was all right. I want you to come to a summit and be like, I could not stop listening. I told all my friends, told them to come. I could not stop listening because that's what's going to have you taking action. And action is what we're about. Inspired action that has you doing the thing that you want to do. So if you want to move abroad, if you want to take a career break, if being an expat has been a dream of yours and you're a black woman, Exodus Homecoming is the place for you. We are going to make sure you leave there feeling like this is something you can do. That's what's really important. We want you to know that you can do it too. And so even if you feel like that, but you feel like there's something missing, you need, there's a something missing from your plan, this is the spot to fill in the blanks. Absolutely. It's all about taking inspired action is what I like to refer to it as. So speaking of inspired action, you talked about your many travels in the beginning and now being in Mexico City. And Mm -hmm. you ride hard for Mexico City on your YouTube channel. I love it. So for someone like me who is listening to this, right, and who has never been to Mexico City, paint a picture if you can. What's a day? I mean, I watch you on the socials, so I know what the day in the life is. But for someone who's listening to this and they're interested in Mexico or maybe never considered, what is it that made you fall in love with this city? It's just an energy. I always say, I don't get as much heat for this as I expect to get, but I always say that it's like New York, but with nice people. Nice, happy, friendly people who want to help you. They're not like mad at you if you're on the wrong side of the sidewalk or on the wrong side of an escalator. No one cares. If that's the case, they'll be like, oh, she must be lost and try to help you get to where you're going. It just, it's a really good feeling. A day in my life is always different. Today, I had a live event in Facebook group, the Exodus Summit Facebook group. I have this interview with you. After that, I'm going to the pool downstairs in my building. After that, I'm going to dinner with a Black woman I met on the street here, right? Like, that's what a day is. It was was important to me to create a life that I didn't have to work full-time to support. So Mexico City has a lower cost of living than most of the U.S. cities I lived in. Now, cost of living is going to depend on what you want out of life, right? But you can live here pretty cheaply, not as cheaply as other cities in Mexico, but this is the largest city. I think it's the largest city in the America, at least in North America. It's huge. There are 
so many people. It's insane how big it is, how many people, how many people are here. I say that I could live here for 10 years and still not have visited all the neighborhoods. It's crazy. And for the most part, when I walk down the street, people are curious, but they don't let their curiosity interfere with what I'm doing. Like, it's not an oppressive curiosity, right? And that's something that we deal with in the States a lot. It's like, what are you doing here? Explain yourself. It's not that as much as it's like, oh, she's not from around here, right? Like, especially I, when I, I stayed in the Airbnb once where I was literally the only tourist in the neighborhood years ago. And people would give me the look of like, what's she doing in this real local, local place? But it was like a, a one to two second look and then a look away. Like they're not staring. No one's taking photos of me. It's like a, a respectful curiosity. I don't mind curiosity as long as it's respectful. No one is touching my hair. No one is taking photos. No one is stopping me from entering a place or asking me if I belong. People are, are just like, I'm going to mind my business. There's a big let me mind my own business <laughs> culture in Mexico city. I don't know what it comes from, but it is a very big, that ain't got none to do with me. That over there ain't got none to do with me. And it's, it's nice. Now that being said, if I look lost on the street, someone is coming up to me to try to help me. Like I was at one point walking and looking at my phone, which I feel safe doing here. And someone walked up to me and was like, I think what you want to do is like, go, cause I was near a subway. I wasn't going in the subway, but they thought I was, and I couldn't figure it out. So they like started to try to explain to me in Spanish what to do. Okay. Like, I appreciate that because I think as someone who's lived in America and now lives in Mexico, I think there's a distinct difference for how the country at large treats immigrants, right. And treats foreigners of any kind. People here try to help me in English in a way that people in America generally are not trying to help people in any other language, right? Like, and there's always the apologies because their English isn't good. And I'm like, you ain't got to speak English. I need to speak Spanish, right? <laughs> like your English is much better than it needs to be. I need to speak Spanish. So let's see if we can work this out. It feels very welcoming. So it feels very welcoming. It is a major city. The museums are first class. The food, I'm praying right now. My head is down. You can't see this, but I'm having a moment for the food. It's just, whether you get it on the street or a five-star restaurant, it is just, everything is good. It's fresh. The fruit is better. The meat is better. Everything tastes better in Mexico as compared to the U.S. Everything. Thank you. Thank you. I can get around cheaply. I, I cannot say enough things about why I love Mexico City. It is a phenomenal place. Now, if you're not city folk, if you are not a city person, don't play yourself. This ain't it for you. Just because it's, it's a city city. It's not like, oh, is it like Cancun or, oh, is it like Playa? No, 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 no. It is a city, city. I have a friend who uh, lived most of her life in Chicago, and then she moved to Playa del Carmen. And she came to Mexico City for a day on a layover, and she was like, no, nah, this is too much. This is too much. I'm like, but you're from Chicago. And she was like, no, girl, this is, I can't, mm -mm, I'm not, mm -mm, mm -mm, no cities, not, this is too much. And I was like, okay, the city, it's a big city. You'll never run out of things to do. You'll never run out of people to meet. I meet Black people from the U.S. on the street all the time, all the time. I'm just like, hey, hi. And I'm very much like, if I see you in the street, I'm going to do my best to get your attention and wave at you. Yes, just yesterday, I was waving down some woman and I'm like, either she has some eyesight issues or she is intentionally acting like she can't see me. I don't know, but I did my part, right? Like I, as a Black woman, seeing another Black woman on the street, Gave her all the hand motions, all the waves, all the hands up above my head, trying to flag her down. And she did the look away, look away, look away. Okay, but that's not my business. That's not my business. Why, ever, why you couldn't see me is not 
my business. I did the, hey girl, hey, did what I could do, right? Most of the time here, I don't get the look away. Most of the time here, especially if they are Black American, it's very much a, like a, hey, what are you doing here? Hey, what are you doing here? Which is how I'm going to dinner tonight <laughs> with a stranger from the streets. But yeah, it's a it's a good life. It's a great city. I feel safe all the time. Granted, I don't go out at night unless I'm going to meet people. Like when I lived here before, there are clubs and things we'd go out now with our good friend Delta running around. I'm inside. They're taking, they take really good COVID precautions here. You have to wear a mask. You have to use hand sanitizer anytime you enter a building. You have to get your temperature taken. Most places still have an entrance, a shoe mat at the entrance with some disinfectant on it. So you're disinfecting your shoes as you come in. I have never seen people clean as much. There is always someone cleaning something. Wherever you go, look around, there is someone disinfecting something. So it's not a perfect city, but it's it's the city for me. I feel like Mexico City should pay me. I need to work that out. I need them to <laughs> run, me, run me some money as much you as know. I talk about how great they are. You do, because I get on your lives, whether it's on Instagram or YouTube, and you're, you know, talking about the tacos and and some of the other fine dining and just your lifestyle. And what you said was really important. You talked about the fact that it is a city and it may not be for everyone. And so that's one of the things that I love and encourage people when they're thinking about moving abroad. Think about your way of life. Maybe you're, the way you're living today, maybe you're in the suburb, suburbs and you really love city life, or maybe you're in city life and you really want to keep that same energy. Getting clear on the life you want to live and the lifestyle that you want to live will often help guide your direction. And what I love about what you said was that when you started this journey, you took a night and you went through your finances, you took stock of what you had, and then you made that leap and also retired. So talk a little bit about one of the things that I have really enjoyed on your channel is a lot of discussions around the FIRE movement. And the FIRE movement has really been impactful in your life. So for someone who's not familiar with the FIRE movement, how has that changed your life and has helped you on your journey? I kind of always feel weird talking about this because I was doing FIRE, which means financial independence, retire early. I was doing FIRE before FIRE was a thing. I got laid off or a thing that was talked about regularly and publicly. So I got laid off in 2009 and I didn't have a job for six months. It was the first time in my life, except for when I was studying for the bar, it was the first time in my life that I didn't have a job for that long. And so I was just positive that I would like my house was going to get repossessed and I was going to lose everything because you are what you produce in society, right? Like your value is as an employee. It was a humbling moment. It was the middle of a recession. So it was like, even if you want a job, girl, what you gonna do, right? I learned a lot about myself. And what I learned that stuck with me the most was that debt makes me very uncomfortable. I didn't realize when I had a job, when I had a high paying job, I didn't realize how uncomfortable it made me because I was just paying everything I had to pay every month, right? And then when I didn't have a job, I was like, but I still have debt. Like how, help me out, Uncle Sam. How do I not have a job, but I still have debt? That math is not mathing. Like what is, what am I supposed to, oh, you don't care? Oh, you don't care that I have to pay this debt. I don't have any job. Okay, so so I can just lose my, lose my house and be homeless. Like that's the answer. In the long run, that's the answer is I lose my house. Now I didn't because I got another job six months later. But when I got that job, my focus became getting out of debt. Every single thing I owed to someone else, go ahead and pay that off. So you never going to call me. It's never, there's not going to be a late payment. There's not going to be a late payment fee because I don't owe you any money. Um, and so I made the focus of my financials getting out of debt. And then I was out of debt, right? Like you, you make it a focus and you, you work on it for a couple of years and shit happens. 
Uh, then my focus was saving in like a good sized emergency fund. I already had an emergency fund, but I, I, I chunked it up a bit, made my, my emergency fund bigger. And then I focused on saving for retirement. I heard of the fire movement. I was already like focused on <laughs> saving, like saving for retirement because I hated these jobs. Like no matter what job I had, I was always like, so I work every day and I get in here. And there's still more work tomorrow? Like where? There's still more work tomorrow. You're telling me that I have done everything on my plate today. And y'all coming in here tomorrow with motion for me to... And it wasn't that it's like, I don't want to work, but truly, I am built for luxury. I do not want to work. <laughs> truly, let's, let's not pretend I'm someone I'm not. I am not interested in labor. But it wasn't just the labor for me. Even before I was at the tech company... My job was to make sure the companies I worked for didn't do anything wrong. Um, so it was like a consumer protection kind of role. But you know what pays well? Doing the wrong thing. And so I was always arguing with people who were trying to make their sales goal or a quota or something. And this great idea they had would get them to their goal and the whole company loved it. And the CEO says we have to do it. And I'm like, but it's illegal. What are we talking about? And any lawyer that they're listening will understand this. It's illegal wasn't enough. Like we would, I would have that conversation with you one day. And then the idea would come back up two days later. And I'd be like, I thought, didn't I tell you it was, and now somebody else is coming to me about someone higher up in the ranks is coming to me about the idea. Like they're about to punk me into being like, no, it's fine. It's fine. Like I said what I said. This is my area of the law. I don't tell you how to sell widgets. I don't go out there and make your sales goals. I'm not on your computer clickety clacking. Why are you over here telling me what needs to happen? Are you sure that it's against the law? And I'm like, I can point it to you on paper or you could just take my word for it because I do this. I does this. And so it was a lot of redundant arguments and it was a lot of like heated, like angry people, angry coworkers, not strangers, angry coworkers in my inbox because they had a great idea. And I was like, nah, dog, nah. Um, at one of my companies, they nicknamed me the dream killer. And I was like, yes, that's actually why I'm here. That is actually what I get paid for. You get paid to come up with these great ideas and I get paid to tell you whether you can do it and you can't do it because it's a terrible idea legally. Like <laughs> legally, it is a terrible, illegal thing. And you don't understand why you don't have to understand why you just have to believe me. But that was where the disconnect happens, right? So the disconnect happens because they don't want to believe you because you're standing in the way of their goal, which means you're standing in the way of their bonus. You're standing in the way of their that good, good money they're expecting. And so instead of it being like, well, Rashida said we can't do it, it would be like I had someone's boss, I spoke to someone's big, big boss who was like, when they say you told them they can't do it, I tell them to go back to you. And I'm like, do you know how much harder this makes my job? <laughs> do you know how much harder it is that I got to argue about the same shit day in and day out? He was like, no, the ones who go back to you automatically, those are the ones I really, really love. They're doing their job. The ones who take your word for it, that's not, mm -mm, I tell them to go back. And I'm like, what? If you want to do it on a Monday and I say no, you can want to do the same thing on a Wednesday. It's still a no. Can you change it a bit? Don't come back to me with the same idea. And so when I say I was do, like, I would do work one day and come back and be the same work the next day, that's what I'm talking about. I was like, I'm not built. I don't argue with people. Like, if you want to do something your way, go for it. I don't care. If I am not extremely invested in your opinion, you can think whatever you want. Like, who am I to argue with you? It doesn't impact my life. And so coming to work and having to argue about things that do not impact my life, like, it's truly just, I want to leave this job at work and I'm getting angry emails on the weekend because you're not about to get your bonus. Come up with a better idea. Come up with a legal idea and then do your thing. I don't care. But it was the like repetitive arguing over things I didn't care about. I'd be there like, but I said no. Oh, you want to take it to my boss? Go ahead. You know what my boss is going to do? She's going to call me into this meeting because she has no idea. 
<laughs> this is not her area of law. So she is going to call me in and say, what can we do? I'm going to say nothing. And that's going to be the end of the story. But sure, go over my head. Great. The idea that that would be the rest of my life was not appealing at all. But I knew pretty early that I didn't want to do that. Now, parts of it felt really good. I was in a role that I needed for myself. I had a, I worked in uh, vehicle finance. I had a very bad experience financing my first vehicle. And so it felt good to go kind of full circle and be in my own way, an advocate for customers where I would be like, no, because that's like, it seems like you're doing them a favor, but you're really not when you do that. So we can't, we're not going to do that. And yes, what you're doing would help them, but it's against the law. So it doesn't matter, right? Like, so those kind of conversations, feeling like a customer advocate in a way was really nice, but arguing, talking to men I don't care about on a daily basis. Oh Lord, no, Mm -mm. I don't. What are we doing here? Why are you writing me aggressive emails? Aggressive ass emails, baby, baby. No, (laughs) like I would just be like, now I got to get mad and get aggressive back. And then from an outsider's perspective, there's only one aggressive person, right? There's only one angry person. Because you can't be the angry black woman in email or in meetings. I'm going to respond calmly and respectfully, but you already know what I want to tell you. And I had like a catch me outside moment with a coworker once, like, we have to talk because if we don't talk now, we're going to have problems in the future. And we came to terms and we understood each other and it was fine, but this couldn't be life, right? And so I knew probably like in 2010, I knew I wanted to retire by 40 and I did it at 39 because when I said I put all the dollars I could towards retirement. I put all the dollars I could before that towards paying off debt. I paid off my mortgage 20 years early. I did everything I could to make sure that I was going to be in a good situation to live the life I wanted. And if I hadn't left the Bay Area, if that company had not gone out of business, I would still be working probably for the same company in the same space and working to pay Bay Area rent. Just leaving a job just because you want to is hard. Like our society is not set up for that. Our parents and our loved ones are not set up for you to quit your job and do whatever you want. Someone is going to be in your ear telling you, no girl, you can't do Like, no, like, what are you going to do? Like, because it's unknown, it seems terrifying to the elders in our lives, to our cousins, to whoever. It's always like, But what about money? And even if you tell them, I got this covered, at least for a little while, it's still like, no, no, no. I have people who still, three years later, are still sending me job descriptions. Girl, it's not never going to happen. It's like, you know what? I did fire so I could fire my job. (laughs) I I did. I did. And so, yeah, fire, I think, is a really great tool for people to use, or it's a really great concept for people to use to think about their finances and think about focusing on how they can reduce their expenses, how they can pay off debt, how they can get themselves in a good position. But if something happens to them, if they lose their job, they don't have to worry. They don't have to rush out and get the first job they could take. What FIRE did for me, even when I was, before I knew it was FIRE, (laughs) but what the concept of paying off all my debt early and saving a lot of money for retirement did for me was it gave me options I didn't realize I had. And I had to tell myself, to even though I have enough money to not go back to work, I want to go back to work anyway. And I was never willing to tell myself that. Once I realized I had enough money that I could live in in a city of my choice, which is Mexico City, and not get another job, I support myself with the businesses we talked about already, and I work a schedule that I like which is whenever I really feel like it. Um, But when when I realized that I had enough money to not go back to work, it became very, very hard to even think about talking to people you don't want to talk to. I don't talk to anyone I don't want to talk to. That is, I would say, as an introvert, probably the best part of 
what I do now is I collaborate with people I want to talk to. I want to talk to you. We're here, right? I don't talk to anyone I don't want to talk to. There are no people sending me aggressive emails because what for? What for? At the most, you're unhappy with something and you want a refund. Baby, I'm never going to argue with you about that. Sure. Have some money. Take it. I work with, for the most part, Black women who have a dream that I can help them achieve. And you know what? Black women with a dream are happy. They are positive. They help each other. Exodus Summit, the Facebook group, is my happy spot on the internet because everyone in there is helpful and kind to each other. They are reassuring. They are supportive. They are each other's cheerleaders. And I love being there. And doing this work has allowed me to co-create that space with those women. And so you mentioned earlier that I created these things. I'm like, they, these are truly co-created with the audience. The course that I teach from Burnout to Bliss, it differs every time I run it because it's really run by the energy of the woman in the course. And they bring that good energy. Like they bring that good energy. They want to see each other around the world when they leave on their own career breaks. They want to see each other. They want to stay in touch. They want to support each other. Those are the women I want to be around, right? And you mentioned earlier that when you're unhappy in your job, when you don't like your job, you're unhappy and that that trickles into your life outside of work. That is definitely who I was. I will say probably like, I hate to imagine it as nine whole years, but like 2009 to 2018, that trickled out into my life. I could build happiness. I could do things that made me happy. But for the most part, the unhappiness I felt at work trickled into other parts of my life as well. And now that is the thing that I'm I am most joyful about leaving behind. My work, there is no unhappiness in my work. I love my business partner. She's a true friend. I love the people I talk to like you, like the energy is just good. That is the thing that I has changed my life the most, right? Even if I'm having a bad day, even if I'm stuck Like I make videos for YouTube, like you mentioned. Editing YouTube videos makes me want to bang my head against the wall sometimes, right? Like I'm just like, what? Like, what? Why is it so hard? But my videos are made by a Black woman for Black women. And the women in the audience who see it and appreciate it, they make it worthwhile. And even if I have a hard time editing that video, when I'm done with that video, the unhappiness is over, right? Like, I'm not bringing it home with me. I just had to do a task that I didn't like to do that I could probably outsource, but I hate outsourcing. So I'm not very good at it. (laughs) Still a little bit of a control freak about certain things. I don't have bad Sunday nights, right? I don't have bad any nights. Like whatever I don't get done today, I, I don't work in an emergency room. There's no true time sensitivity, right? Like this is not an, this is not an emergency. I do not have to sew up somebody's wound. If I don't get this video out today, it'll go out the next day. If I don't respond to this email today, people will understand or they won't, right? And I like to work with people who are understanding. If you're not, okay, we don't have to continue on doing anything. Nothing in my life is mandatory, nothing. If I want to stay in bed for six weeks, I will. I have no desire to do that, but I could, right? Because that's the life I've built for myself. That is awesome. I really believe that your vibe attracts your tribe. And when I am in the Exodus Summit Facebook group, and I, of course, follow you on the socials and subscribe to your YouTube channel. So I see that that vibe and that frequency resonates with so many people and has impacted so many. And so I hope if you're listening to this episode and you've never heard of Rashida, Go into the show notes, get all the socials, follow, subscribe, join, participate in the Exodus Homecoming. I'll have that below this episode. And gosh, Rashida, this has been such fun. I've laughed on mute (laughs) so much, but it is really, I mean, so much joy that you bring to what you do 
and your journey has really been a testimony. And so I am grateful for having this connection with you to be able to share in this space and vibe with your vibe. And yeah, as we close, can you let the people know where to find you? I am on YouTube at youtube.com slash she does on the loose. I'm going to spell this for you. There's a good chance I'm going to spell it wrong because I can only keep so much of my brain at one time, but it's S H I D A S O N T H E L O O S E. She does on youtube.com backslash she does on the loose. Uh, my website is she does on the loose.com spelled the same way. Uh, my IG is Sheeta D S H I D A D. That is where you can find me most of the time or in Exodus summits, Facebook group. You can just do, I think Exodus summit slash community will take you there. I have a guide. If you want to take a sabbatical, I have a guide to help people do that. And it can be found at bit.ly sabbatical planning guide. I'm sure that's going to be in the show notes though, because I might've had that a little bit wrong. You all can't expect me to remember URLs off the top of my head. Like who does that? Exodus homecoming. There's a weekend pass and there are accelerated passes. The accelerated passes get you more. The weekend pass is open to anyone. You don't have to be black. You don't have to be a woman. Black men come through. Other people Come through on a weekend pass if you want to. The accelerated pass is only for Black women because we want to keep, it's really important to us that we have a safe space for Black women where we can speak freely without being judged, without being spoken over, uh, and we can have a place that is our own. And so because there are interactive portions to the weekend, to the accelerated pass, that ticket is only available to Black women. That is probably the best place to find me right now is at Exodus Homecoming, because we are doing the work to make sure the people who attend, re- their lives change, that they take action this year, that instead of coming to the next homecoming in the same position they're in now, they can come back to the next homecoming as speakers. So we're really excited about that. I'm excited. And like I said, I have to get my ticket. So I encourage everyone to do the same. I will link all of that in the show notes for this episode. And with that, I want to thank you for being such an incredible guest on the Blacks of Global podcast and most importantly, what you do for the community. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Blacksit Global Podcast. For more information on today's episode, be sure to visit our website at blacksitglobal.com. It's not only possible to live out your dreams unbothered and in full color, it is your birthright. Are you trying to sort out health plans, banking, VPN, and other connectivity for your move abroad? Well, have no fear. We've got you with the Move Abroad Starter Kit. Get yours today at blacksitglobal.com slash resources. That's blacksitglobal.com slash resources.